Hello everyone. Today we'll discuss about the biomechanics of solder complex. Here we'll discuss about the function of the solder complex, the bony components that form the solder complex. The components of the solder complex are sternoclavicular joint, acromioclavicular joint, scapulothoracic joint and glenohumeral joint. So there are four joints which form the solder complex. The function of the solder complex is to link upper limb or upper extremity to the trunk or you can say it links the upper appendicular skeleton system to the axial skeleton system. It provides mobility of the arm in space. It provides stability for elbow and hand for skillful or forceful movements. The bony components or the osseous components that form the solder complex are clavicle, scapula, humerus, manibrum sterni and first rib. You can see in the picture this bone is the clavicle, this is humerus, this bone is scapula and then the manibrum sterni. First bone is the clavicle that forms the solder complex. It is a S-shaped bone and anterior surface is convex medially and concave laterally. Long axis of the clavicle is oriented 20 degrees posterior to the frontal plane and slightly above the horizontal plane. So the clavicle is positioned not in the frontal plane neither in the horizontal plane. It is 20 degree posterior to the frontal plane and slightly above the horizontal plane. So anatomically it is in slightly elevated position. The parts of the clavicle are the soft, sternal and coastal facet, superior surface, inferior surface, coastal tuberosity, acromial end, acromial facet, conoid tubercle, trapezoid line. So this we all know from the anatomy that the clavicle has a shaft, it has a sternal end and a scapular end. Towards the sternal end it has a coastal facet, it has a coastal tuberosity. Here you can see in the second picture it has an inferior surface which, con which contains two tubercles that is conoid tubercle and the trapezoid line. Next bone is the scapula. It has three angles, inferior, superior and lateral. It has three borders that is medial, superior and anterior border. Two processes and tubercles are present in scapula that is coracoid and acromion. You have infraglenoid tubercle, supraglenoid tubercle as well which is above and below the glenoid fossa. Scapula contains four fossa that is supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, subscapular fossa and glenoid fossa. Glenoid cavity is a pure shaped fossa which is 41 mm longitudinally and 25 mm transversely. Here in this glenoid fossa one third or four, one fourth of the humerus articulate Scapula is slightly in superior tilt position that is around 5 degree and scapula is slightly antiverted up to 7 to 10 degrees. These are some of the anatomical facts about scapula. Humerus has a head which is superiorly it has an anatomical neck. Just beside the anatomical neck it has a greater tubercle and lesser tubercle which we already know. Between the lesser and greater tubercle, we have a bicipital group which is also called as intertubercular sulcus. Then below here we have a deltoid tuberosity where the deltoid muscle gets inserted. Let's come to the distal part of the humerus. In the distal part we have a medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle. Laterally we have trochlea and uh, medially we have a capitulum and this part bilaterally it is called as supracondylar ridge so the head of the 
humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity whereas capitulum and trochlea inferiorly articulates with radius and ulna. One more point we need to remember here is that longitudinal and transverse articulating surface of the humeral head is twice that of the diameter of the glenoid fossa. The diameter of the humeral head is about 37 to 55 millimeter. So therefore it has high chance of anterior dislocation, posterior dislocation, and inferior dislocation. The head of the humerus is twice larger than the glenoid fossa to allow more mobility at the glenohumeral joint. As we know that glenohumeral joint is the most mobile, one of the most mobile joint, whereas it compromises with stability. That is the head of the humerus is bigger than the glenoid fossa therefore there is high chance of inferior anterior or posterior dislocation of the humeral head. The angle of inclination is about 130 to 150 degree. The angle of inclination is the angle between the axis of the humeral shaft with the axis of the humeral head. So it is about 130 to 150 degree. The angle of torsion is about 30 to 40 degree. Angle of torsion is also called as posterior torsion or retro torsion. It is the angle between the axis crossing both the condyles with the axis of the humeral head. Coming to next bone that forms the shoulder complex is the manubrium sterni. Clavicle gets attached to the manubrium sterni, the sternal end of the clavicle on both sides of the manubrium sterni forming the sternoclavicular joint. It also gives a lot of attachment to the muscles such as sternocleidomastoid, pectoralis major on the uh, sides of the sternum. Now coming to joints of the shoulder complex. So we already know there are four joints forming the shoulder complex that is acromioclavicular joint, glenohumeral joint, scapulothoracic joint and sternoclavicular joint. Glenohumeral joint, one of the important joint of the upper limb and the most mobile joint of the upper limb. What type of joint is the glenohumeral joint? It is synovial ball and socket type of joint. The joint components that form the glenohumeral joint is the convex head of the humerus which is directed medially, posteriorly and superiorly. And the other component which forms the glenohumeral joint is the concave glenoid fossa. Next joint is called a sternoclavicular joint. Joint components that form the sternoclavicular joint are medial end of the clavicle which is saddle shaped and clavicular facet of the sternum which also is saddle shaped. The medial end of the clavicle also gets attached with the superior border of the first rib. The function of the sternoclavicular joint is to link the upper limb with the axial skeleton. Acromioclavicular joint, it is formed between the lateral end of the clavicle and the acromion process. It is a plain type of joint with flat or slightly convex or concave articulating surface. Scapulothoracic joint is formed between the anterior surface of the scapula and the posterior lateral wall of the thorax. In anatomical position, the scapulothoracic joint lies between 2nd to 7th rib and it is about 6 cm away from the spine. We know there is no direct contact between the scapula and the ribs. The muscles of the thorax and the muscles anterior to the scapula that is subscapularis muscle form this joint so it is also called as a false joint. The average resting position of this joint is about 10 degree of anterior tilt, 5 to 10 degrees of upward rotation and 35 degrees of internal rotation. These are some of the basics of shoulder joint or shoulder complex. Now let us discuss about the osteokinematics of glenohumeral joint. While discussing about the osteokinematics, we need to mention the movements occurring at the joint, the planes and axes at which the movement occurs and the range of motion of that movement. The movement occurring at the glenohumeral joint are 
flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, internal and external rotation and horizontal abduction and horizontal adduction. So these are the movements. Now let us discuss about the planes and axis at which this movement occurs and the range of motion. The abduction and adduction movement occurs in coronal plane and sagittal axis. So you can see the movement that is occurring at the coronal plane and sagittal axis. Coronal plane is also called as frontal plane. The range of motion of this abduction is 180 degree, 0 to 180 degree. But at the glenohumeral joint, it is 0 to 120 degree. With addition of 60 degree of scapular rotation, the total of 180 degree can be achieved for shoulder abduction. This shoulder abduction is naturally accompanied by external rotation of 35 to 40 degree. Next movement is flexion and extension. The flexion and extension occurs in sagittal plane and coronal axis. The range of motion of flexion is also 0 to 180 degree and extension is 0 to 60 or 0 to 65 degree. But we have to remember 0 to 120 degree of flexion is available at glenohumeral joint but total of 180 degree is achieved with scapular movement. The internal and external rotation of the glenohumeral joint occurs in horizontal plane and vertical axis in anatomical position. The range of motion for internal rotation is 75 to 80 degree and for external rotation is 60 to 70 degree in abducted position. So in osteokinematics, you need to mention only three points that is movement occurring at the joint, the planes and axis of that movement and the range of motion. So we have learned that in glenohumeral joint, there is abduction and adduction which occurs in coronal plane and sagittal axis. There is flexion and extension which occurs in sagittal plane and coronal axis and there is internal and external rotation which occurs in horizontal plane and vertical axis and you need to mention their range of motion respectively.